Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise God. We thank God for uh, his goodness and his grace and his mercy on today. We thank uh, saints for the prayers of the righteous availing, availing much. We thank God for the day that he's made. We rejoice. We're glad in it. And we are uh, delighted to have you with us in Bible study tonight. We thank God for your attendance because a strong soldier is... Uh, makes a strong kingdom and we bless God for just the opportunity to do his work to build his kingdom in this day and age if you're visiting with us tonight we say to you uh, welcome to Haskell Heights First Baptist Church or as we nickname ourselves the height we uh, we also um, are delighted that you're with us and for those of you who are regular attenders we ask that you take a moment and send the link out to somebody just uh, do the work of an evangelist. Go ahead and, and say, hey, neighbor, hey, friend, hey, cuz, uh, hey, it's somebody. Join us in, um, you know, join us in, in Bible study for tonight, okay? Um, we just send them the link and they can catch up with us uh, wherever we are. You can also um, let them know that the link is available until, um, uh, until the... Uh, next week when we will post the next link amen for a full week then it'll be posted to uh, Facebook after that okay all right God bless you we do have several announcements on tonight and uh, first of which we want to say happy anniversary to Deacon Johnny and Deaconess Teresa Jones uh, hope that they are enjoying their anniversary on today and uh, we, we want to announce to you that the clothing ministry is in need of infant toddler and children's clothing and shoes the ministry will be open and distributing clothing items this saturday june 18th from 10 to 12. Uh, mark your calendars this saturday june 18th 10 to 12 clothing ministry uh, also columbia housing authority is accepting applications for its summer youth employment program if you have a young person child grandchild neighbor friend cousin whatever um, the high school students living in public housing or using housing choice vouchers are encouraged to apply. And you can go out for more information to www.columbiahousingsc.org. www.columbiahousingsc.org. That'll be for Summer Youth Employment, that Summer Youth Employment Program. Mark your calendars for two upcoming events. Our graduation recognition service is going to be held on Sunday, June 26th at 11 o'clock. Rising high school sophomores, juniors, seniors are asked to contact Sister Mary Clark or Sister Pam Jennings to serve as marshals during the graduation service. Also, um, VBS 22, 2022, we're going to... Uh, be, we're going to be emphasizing brain power, maximizing our mental fitness. We're going to do something a little different this year. VBS is going to be held virtually and on site for three nights. That'll be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Monday evening, Tuesday evening, Wednesday evening. Adults and children are welcome. Uh, June 27th, 28th, and 29th from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. 30 p.m. All right. Refreshments will be served nightly and we'll wrap up on Wednesday with a cookout. So all are intend to uh, invited to attend. Bring your um, uh, invite your neighbors, invite your friends. Come and we're going to do, be doing something very powerful that will last you through your summer study months. Amen. And we're excited about that brain power, maximizing our mental fitness. And that's in honor of uh, our continued efforts to observe the uh, National Mental Wellness Month, amen, on last month. So we thank God for that. Uh, weekly Bible study will be on summer hiatus following uh, VBS. So uh, VBS, Vacation Bible School, then Bible study will be going on vacation. But we're going to have plenty of work for you to be doing during your summer month, amen. And we're going to ask that you would uh, prepare to resume on Wednesday, September 7th, and keep your... Uh, your, keep keep your eyes on the calendar. We will be having other events this summer that we're going to want you to participate in and so that we can stay connected. Amen. Sunday school will continue during that time and we will get announcements to you for anything. More than, more than anything, if you're doing traveling this summer, if you've already started, if you've already planned, we're going to ask that you please do every, make every effort to be safe. I know that it is, um, 
It was 101 degrees as of my last, last check. And, um, and, and I did even hear that in Montana today that the roads are actually melting, oh. that the highways are actually melting. And so we're experiencing a, a very catastrophic heat wave. Please do your very best to uh, stay safe, stay hydrated, and, um, and, and, and be in health. Amen. And so we're, uh, we, that, that's, a, that's a, a strong reminder uh, for Christians that if it's this hot at 101, <laughs> you don't want no parts of hell. Amen. So we, um, we just want you to uh, get your business in order and, and get it straight. And for those, you and for all those that you love and are connected to. Amen. All right. We're, we're going to pray for, um, <clears throat> we're going to pray a prayer of healing um, tonight just for any of you who's experiencing any kind of uh, sickness, affliction, um, anything that is out of order that needs to be returned to order, whether that be in your body, whether that be in your mind, whether that be in a, in a situation in your life that really needs God's healing touch. Amen. And just a short prayer, but we're going to stand in agreement one with another that God would, would, would touch every aspect of our lives and bring us to the place we, where we are whole and not broken. Amen. So if you just join me tonight for and bow your heads for a moment. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord God, that we have a God that we can come to, not just a God over the universe, but the one we call Abba, Father, Lord God, the one who is concerned about every care, every need that we have. We bless you for just the opportunity to walk right into your throne room and find grace to help in our time of need. God, we lift up um, any sicknesses, Lord God. In fact, sickness to this degree that there is anything that is out of order mm -hmm. according to your word now in the name of Jesus. It might be a broken mind. It might be a broken situation. It might be a broken heart. It might be a broken body function or body part. Oh God, we're asking that you would demonstrate your power towards us, Lord God, and, and, and bring us healing and, and, and save us in this manner. For that is what you promised. That's what you did on the cross on Calvary. And we receive and accept what you've done, Lord God. But we don't just want to be takers, Lord God. Take your graces, mm -hmm. Lord God. But we want to, as you bless us, Lord God, we want to be the vessels that will bless others in the same way that you blessed us. Help us to, to reach out and touch others, Lord God, and speak the word of healing. Pray the word of healing, Lord God, the prayer of healing, Lord God. And just bring encouragement to the lives of those who are struggling in any way tonight. We call every circumstance and situation better now. We call it whole, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. We speak shalom to every life and circumstance tonight within the body and, uh, and over those that we are concerned about. Everyone that we're connected with, we touch right now through this prayer. And we thank you in advance, Lord God, for your change Lord God, that change that will come to, to bring you glory, Lord God, and us benefit. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. By his stripes we are healed. And, and that healing is a comprehensive healing. It's not just a bodily brokenness, but it's a life brokenness. Our lives are healed because of the cross at Calvary. Amen. All right, you can get a copy of the handout tonight. Um, it's called Jesus in Obscurity. And, um, and, and it's available on our website, www.haskellheightsfbc.com. Just click the Bible study option, or you can get a copy of it on our church app, our mobile app. You can download that. Uh, for those of you who don't have that downloaded, we're looking for about 100% participation among those of you who have cell phones. Download the app. Encourage friends to download the app. They don't have to be members of the church to have the app. It just means that they have access to our Bible studies, our, uh, our resources, and our prayers, and all those things that we, uh, we want to be able to touch the lives of others with. Amen? We're, we, it's time out for a selfish kingdom. We've got to come and unite ourselves as one uh, in the body of Christ. And so we're asking that you would please do that. Go to your mobile app store. Uh, if that's the Apple store, if that's the uh, Google Play store, whatever it is, go out there, search under Haskell Heights First Baptist Church. And the, the app is called The Height. Download it. And then you can um, 
you, you can get access to all of the Bible studies and, and everything that we post uh, is available out there. Also, we just want to give you um, thanks in advance for your faithful support of the ministry through tithes and offerings. And um, we, we bless God for um, just your diligence to keep the kingdom of God flourished and alive. And we speak life over us in this ministry and, and, and over all those that we connect with. All right. So having said that, I said enough words. I think you got uh, had enough time to get a copy of the uh, handout. If you don't have one available in your site, uh, it'll still be available for a whole week. So you can do that and just kind of pay attention to those things we're going to be talking about. If you are not in a place where you can get the, the handout tonight, we'll be looking at uh, primarily the scripture from Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 through 20. We're going to do a great portion of Matthew in our study because Matthew is going to serve as the larger model of the things that are going on in the, the other Gospels. And, and we'll point out some differences in the other Gospels um, as, we, as we move forward to that. But Matthew, uh, for the obvious reasons, it was written to convince the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Amen. And so um, it, it is a it's powerful teaching and, and powerful um, information that we need that can become revelation and transform our lives. All right. So I open up because of the title with Jesus in obscurity. I open up with the definition of obscurity, which is the state of being unknown. Something that's un obscured is, is hidden. Something that's um, that uh, is the state of being unknown, right? Inconspicuous or unimportant. In, in some cases, that which, you know, folks aren't necessarily paying attention to the to the little guys, to the to the ones who don't necessarily have a primary primary importance or influence in a culture. If you're kind of one of the uh, just the average everyday working folks, you, you don't necessarily have a name for yourself. And so uh, it would be obscured. Amen. It's um, not known to many people. So when we talk about Jesus in obscurity. We're talking about um, the second phase of his ministry that we went through the, the, the several stages of his ministry. And the first was Jesus in preparation, where it was his baptism, his uh, temptation in the wilderness, his birth. You, you get that, right? His, his uh, travel to Egypt, his return. We did all that in the scriptures. And so now we're talking about when he was not so well known at the beginning of a ministry, at, you know, those who just are startups aren't necessarily well known. It's not until Jesus began to do the work that he came to do that he became uh, kind of a, a very strong, what we would call influencer in our day. Mm -hmm. Amen. But but he became a, a quite a um, he became quite a visible and and not only that but in high demand, uh, you know, um, person in the in his culture. So I say on the form, I said the beginning of Jesus' ministry was a period of obscurity. What we have to remember is that the Jews were expecting a Messiah. The Jews were expecting a Messiah. Jesus was announced that as that Messiah by John, meaning John the Baptist. But he began to spend time out among the people he came to serve, right? Um, he, and, and so, you know, even though he was obscure, it didn't stop him from going out to do what he did. You don't need a name for yourself to be able to do the work. God is counting uh, what you do. We're going to talk about that tonight as well. I uh, said, so when, when we left off in Matthew chapter 4, I wanted to just visit back there again. On last week, Matthew chapter 4, we saw Jesus beginning his ministry. And so Matthew 4, uh, verses 23 and through 25, got a couple other scriptures that, that are kind of intertwined tonight so that we get some context. And I think this is just a very powerful lesson. But um, uh, Matthew tw uh, 4, 23 through 25, I'm missing the W there. Um, but Matthew 4, 23 through 25 uh, it says, And Jesus went all about all Galilee. Remember, he came back to Galilee, but he went all about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. So I, I wanted to just make sure, you know, so I made some emphasis when I do my Bible study, personal Bible study. I do a lot of circling, highlighting, that kind of thing. And I encourage you to do the same thing because it, it's the stuff that you meditate on. 
Amen. Um, you don't have meditation doesn't doesn't necessarily just mean and Jesus that you do this. And Jesus went about all Galilee. And Jesus went about all Galilee. And Jesus went about all Galilee. But it means that you stop and make consideration. You give great thought to words, concepts, things that just jump out at you. It's the opportunity for you to begin to think on those things, consider them. Um, see what importance they have in the passage. See what, um, you know, what significance it has. Just stop, pause, and, and think on it. Meditate, right? Ponder those things uh, is what Mary did that were in, in her heart. She pondered what she was told. So she, she didn't just kind of rehearse it because meditation actually means rehearsing, but it doesn't just mean just rote rehearsing. It means to stop and consider and think about it. And that's a good time to ask God some questions. You know what I mean? So that's good. Just, just a note on good Bible study. Jesus went about all Galilee. He started in Galilee. Look what he did. Teaching. I got it in red. Preaching and healing. This is what he did. He went about teaching, preaching, and healing. So when he came, what we're interested in is we want the model for what Jesus actually did in his ministry so that we know what, uh, he said, greater works than these that I did, will you do? So in other words, we, we've got to study what he did to know what we should do. So he went about teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, right? The gospel, the good news of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. And so right away, it gives you some sense of what the culture needed. What, you know, what was needed in that culture was teaching in their synagogues. And I thought about this, that um, it, when you start to meditate, here's where you go. That he taught in the synagogues, but he went then to preach the gospel of the kingdom, right? And that means like out in the culture. So the teaching was really for the synagogues. You know, what we, what we ought to be doing more of in church is teaching. The synagogue is the precursor to what is the church. The, the saints of God who are the ones who frequent the church need to be taught. Amen? Not necessarily preached to. The kingdom, we're all we're generally those folks who come to church. Unless you bring the unsaved with you, then, then you're really talking to the group of people who have already made commitments to, the, to, to follow Jesus Christ. And we need to be taught. What we need to be doing. Amen. Amen. Yes, it's reprogramming in the kingdom. But preaching the gospel of the kingdom, that's mean, that means telling other folks who don't know about the good news, telling them they're out in the culture, not in the synagogue. When they come out of the culture, where do they go? In the synagogue, mm -hmm. in, this, in this place, right? And then he said, look at this, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. And so I would say you, you would normally equate sickness as disease. And I would look at it and say, no, this is not a parallel statement. He wasn't just uh, he wasn't just repeating himself. So there is a slight difference between sicknesses and diseases, correct? So so just keep that, ponder that in your mind, think about it and meditate on that and just ask God, I wonder what the difference is between the sicknesses and the diseases. And I kind of brought that together in the prayer that that the, the sicknesses are really things that are broken. Amen. And, and guess what? Your finances can be sick. Your, hello. I mean, there, there can be d different things that are broken in your life. Relationships, your, you know, um, just your, your attitude, your, um, your, your determination or your, your fortitude. Things that can be broken that really need healing. Amen. So just thinking about it like that. Verse 24. Still Matthew 2, um, 4, but verse 24. Then his fame, remember, we're talking about obscurity, but now it says, then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought um, and, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were de uh, demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them, right? So, so look at what's going on in the culture. Look at what's happening in the culture. There were paralytics. People were paralyzed. People, there were epileptics. There were demon-possessed, right, in the parallel. And, and 
Um, I got a question. My question is, so when did demon possession actually stop? It didn't. I, th I think what you're looking at in a lot of the culture, when you get somebody who can go in and mass murder a lot of kids in a school setting, and I, I think that that's demonically inspired. Mm -hmm. And so what it means, you know, now, now in the same way, I want you to, I want you to see this, that um, look, look at this, just so we get a sense. Demon, uh, which is a fallen, y'all know what the next word is? Angel. It's a fallen angel, right? So they're fallen angels. So, and, and when we say fallen, that really means a rebellious. Remember I used that word in um, preaching on Sunday? A rebellious angel. But, but he's still, even though he's a rebellious angel, nonetheless, he is still an angel. He has the same, uh, he has the same power. He has the same ability. He has the same, um, uh, the same composition as the angels did, but, but he's fallen. He's a demon or a fallen angel. And so when, when, when we look at things like this, we need to, we need to kind of understand that um, a demon wants to, it, well, a demon is a, what kind of creature? It's a spirit creature. Let me just look at that. It's a spirit creature. So it's not a human being. And so because of the nature of them being a spirit creature, they can possess you. Right? That means they can come and live in you. Influence. Right? Now, I said all that just so that you could understand this. That, that the Holy Spirit, let's see, the Holy Spirit is the chief spirit of God. He has spirit characteristics just like angels have spirit characteristics. And so the Holy Spirit comes to look at this, to possess you, to live in you. And, and when, we, when, we're, when we're occupied by the Holy Spirit, mm. we don't have room for the demons to occupy us. To occupy us. It's not, you got some of the Spirit and some of the demon. You, you are occupied. But we're always going to be telling you, be filled with the Spirit. Amen? Be controlled. Be full of the Spirit. Because you don't leave room for the enemy to, to occupy your thoughts, influence your life, all those kind of things. These people were demon-possessed. I believe that there are still demon-possessed folks, folks who yield of their vessel to demons and their influence and do crazy things Demonic. in the culture. Amen? And so we're yielding ourselves. We are in a cosmic or a spiritual battle. Does that make some sense to you? Mm -hmm. Hopefully... Hopefully that makes some sense. But this is the this is the environment that Matthew chapter four is in, where it's talking about. Um, and and we know this. We still got epileptics. We still got um, paralyzed. Those who are afflicted with various diseases. There are still dis various diseases. That those are the results of sin. The presence of demons, demonic influence, um, rebellion in the culture. Just you know, sin characterizes uh, a culture by showing its weakness. In terms of its health, in terms of its wealth, in terms of its uh, vitality, it, uh, that, that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He robs us of what God intended for us to have. Amen? So this is what Jesus came in. Verse 25, great multitudes followed him. And so when, when the church, Jesus who is the, um, Jesus who is the Messiah... We're going to come to notice that his body, he's the head, Ephesians 5, his body is the body of Christ. Am I making some sense? We are the body of Christ. What's on the body? Hands, legs, arms, even heart, right? We, 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 we don't want to be the head. We want to be the body. We want to do the work that he came to do. Be the hands of Jesus. Be the arms of Jesus. Be the legs. Be the feet of Jesus. Be the heart of Jesus. When, when, as, as we're given, you, you got where I'm going from that, right? But it says great multitudes followed him and great multitudes would follow us who would be doing the work of Christ. 
How do we change a culture? How do we change a neighborhood? How do we change a house? Mm. How do we change anything? That as we do the work of Christ, great multitudes will follow. Because people have needs. Yeah. Man, we could, we could, we could go on forever in Bible study there. Um, he went from Galilee to Decapolis to Jerusalem, to Judea, and beyond the Jordan. I put all those things in a little map there so you could see um, where the, you know, where the, the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan, um, the Dead Sea and the Jordan River, which connects them. And so he, he was all over these areas. And, and there was no, there were no BMWs back then. He couldn't get it on the, on the raceway. Amen. He was all over these areas. And, and, and that's what he did. And tonight we're going to be studying how an obscure man, hallelujah. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm really going to say this. I'm going to go ahead and just say it right at the beginning. Um, uh, so that, so that you can keep this theme for tonight. Come out of obscurity. Uh-oh. Come out of obscurity. Which really means what? Come out of hiding. We got to get busy and do the work of Christ. I'm gonna say it and say it and say it until we we were flooded doing it. Amen. He did all that. So today, look at my sheet again. Today we're going to look at the early days of, of, of at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. We're in lesson 18 in the Training for Service book, page 69, and the author author makes a good point. Um, that the book of John is the only gospel that tells us much about the period of obscurity. Because right here in Matthew chapter 4 where I showed you, it says his fame went out all throughout Syria. So if you want to find, so the differences between the different gospels, one of the major differences is John starts during that period of obscurity when he did not, when he was at a wedding and in Cana of Galilee, that's only in John. And so when, when he performed his first miracle, we don't get that in the other Gospels. We get that from, from the book of John, for instance. Amen. And, and look what I say here. Um, as we leave off from Matthew, we see the crowds followed him. and He was becoming well known. That is, what, that is why it is important to study all of the Gospels, to piece together the complete story we are told about his time of ministry on the earth. We are in Matthew to get a sense of the experience with the Jews we just studied about, um, at, at, you know, in, uh, during the prophets in Babylonian captivity and back and then the 400 years of, of what they called silence between the Testaments. We will look at the first half of Matthew. Um, I'm sorry, that should say five. I messed that up. So just make a note on your paper. We're going to look at the first half of Matthew five today to get this sense Jesus began to prepare his disciples for the work of ministry. We get insight from um, Ephesians 4. I want you to grab this. Now, I know we're not, in the, we're not in, the, uh, in the New Testament yet, but I want you to see the connections already at a very early time when we're studying um, just, the, just the Gospels. But, but Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, um, about what, uh, it was about what he was beginning to do at this time. What he was beginning to do when, when in, in Matthew chapter 5. And they say, see how the scripture is connected. Here's what Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 says. And he himself gave some to be apostles. Circle the word apostles because those were the disciples that we're studying about now. That, that basically were, were, were commissioned. And we'll, we'll talk about what's the difference between an apostle and, and a disciple when we get there um, in, the, in the gospel. But it said he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now look, verse 12, why did he give these gifts, these offices, these leaders, these functions? He gave it for the equipping of the saints. For the equipping of the saints. Let me say it one more time. For the equipping of the saints. Hallelujah. For the work of ministry. Who then is supposed to be do the work of ministry? The saints. Who's supposed to equip the saints? The apostles. The prophets. The evangelists. The pastors. The teachers. Y'all got where I'm coming from? That's what. And, and so we've we modeled a church 
after almost like a spectator event where 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 the pastor um, is the one that is expected to to either I guess what we would call preach people's souls happy. And I think you know God is saying time out with that. I didn't ask pastors to come and preach people's souls happy. I came to I told them to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. These are the last days. We're living in tumultuous times, as Sister Wickfall said. That, that was we're, we're in we're in terrible times, and and the world must be crying out is what Romans eight really for the sons and daughters of God wake up. Y'all come out of hiding, come out of obscurity, do the work because the world is getting worse. My God, look at this. Um, he said, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And, and look at verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. Till we all come to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, is, God wants none to perish, but he wants everyone to come to a knowledge of who God is, the Son of God. Through Jesus Christ, he wants people to come to a knowledge because that the, imp the implication is that when people come to a knowledge of who he is, then, then they will, they, they will um, leave their wicked ways. They will prepare themselves as disciples of a, an everlasting kingdom as occupants, your citizenship changes. I don't, don't want to go too far, but you get what I'm saying is that as we do the work that we're assigned to do, that it changes the culture. We can't, we can't sit back and shake our heads at what's going on in the culture and then do nothing. Yeah, we're, I mean, all this out of Matthew chapter 5. Um, look at what I say, and I put it in big, bold letters, and I put them in all caps because that's what you do in, on um, digital devices when you're really trying to yell at folks, right? So, um, uh, you know, we are responsible for more than just coming to church. The average Christian thinks they will just be going to heaven to get rid of the struggle of their struggle on earth. But we will all be judged for the work we were originally put on earth to accomplish. Don't leave with your work undone. So that should be an exclamation point there. Turn to um, page two for me. Um, I gave you I gave you a proof of this. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10, um, and then 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and, and through 15. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. That is our ambition, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed, rewarded, for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And so that recompensed really means receive your pay, right? Is, is receive your, your accolade or your reward. Whether, now, and, and what this tells me in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10, I started there as, as opposed to in 1 Corinthians, is because it says whether good or bad, we're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ and, and the things that we did that God was pleased with will be rewarded. The things that we did that God was not pleased with will be exposed. This is, he, he's not talking to the sinners. The judgment seat of Christ is, is actually the judgment of believers. We're going, to, we're going to have our works measured, whether or not all the things, all the deeds that we did in the body according to what he has done, what, whatever we've done while we were in flesh, while we were in the body. You don't leave with your work undone. Our work encompasses a whole great deal more than just coming to church on Sunday. Amen. Now, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15 says, According to the grace of God which he has given me, which given, was given me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. Listen to what Paul's saying. I laid a foundation and another is building on it. 
I laid a foundation. He did his part. And another is building on it. We are kingdom builders. Look what he says. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Doesn't that describe the culture? Everybody's trying to lay a foundation of their own, as if they're building their own king kingdom. God says that you don't need to build a new kingdom. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Jesus put the kingdom, he laid the foundation, correct? So look, look what he says. Um, now, if, a, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stalk, straw, each man's work will become evident. Everybody's not going to build with gold. I could preach this all night. Everybody's not going to build with gold. Maybe some silver, some precious stones, some wood, some hay, some straw. But each man's work, each woman's work will become evident. Your work, you, you, whatever God has called you in which, whichever uh, way and venue God has called you to build in this kingdom, we got to get busy doing that. Amen? Building into the lives of people. Uh, for, look what it says. Uh, for the day will show it because it will be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Lord, Lord, Lord. That, that, that kind of sets me straight. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So, so he's not talking again to unbelievers. This is the judgment seat of Christ where your works will be evaluated. And, and some people are just content to get into the kingdom. And he says, you, you will be saved. Yet, even though it's as though through fire, you will be saved. You're, you're saved. You're going to heaven. But are you a builder? Are, are you a builder? So, and, and with that, that's the, that is the, um, that's the platform that I want you to go look at the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter five. We got twenty verses. I'll leave you alone. We'll probably finish early tonight because it's not, it's 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 not. Um, it, I think the message is really going to be real easy, real clear. Um, look look what it says. It's Matthew chapter five verses one through twenty, and it's called the Beatitudes. All right, the attitudes which should be. Okay, we'll look at it like this. But verse one says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a high mountain, and when he was seated. His disciples came to him. He went on a high mountain. His disciples came to him, and they were. They, uh, he was seated. His disciples came around him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them. And and um, I take this as a as a visual for me. Jesus went on the mountain, sat down, and the people came and well, some, they, they sat down. Um, I, I say sat at his feet because he's elevated. And some, you know, maybe that's why we got pulpits, that kind of stuff. But we get real comfortable. Um, he's sitting down. Most preachers stand up and the people sit down. But, the, but, but you know, he was sitting down and the people were crowding, the, the, the disciples were crowding around him. And he's teaching them. This is, what, this is a model, I believe, of what Jesus wants us who are disciple, principal disciple makers to be doing. Just, just think about it. It, um, always, it always convicts me. Um, but look what he says. Then he opened his mouth and he taught them. He opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, look at this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to stop right there for one second because um, I, need you to, I need you to see this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm all over the board here. Poor in spirit. Because a lot of people, uh, a lot of people are confused with what this poor in spirit really is really means. Um, I want you to say this. I want you to put this. It means spiritually poor. Or it's spiritual poverty. So when, when you look at poor in spirit, and I think um, th this is really saying something real powerful for today. 
that, that this, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. And most folks would go, well, blessed, ain't nothing blessed about being poor at all. Except that this is poor in, in uh, spiritually, which is an acknowledgement that God, um, I need your spirit. That, that you've got to live as if you were a, in a spiritual deficit for the Holy Spirit to fill you up. It's, it's about spiritual poverty really describes your dependence on Jesus for everything. Your dependence on God. And so what he was saying, he said, now look what he says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God says that the kingdom of heaven belongs, that God gives of the kingdom of heaven to those who are not, you know, we, we, we like to do this thing in the, you shall not be in any lack. But the Beatitudes, the the disciples, Jesus taught his disciples, it's good to have spiritual deficits so that I can be your filler. Mm. So so that, you know, and and, and look look at the opposite of that. The rich in spirit don't really need God because they got their own spiritual path. They have their own spiritual journey. And that's what we got characterizing our world today. Um. I, I don't even know. I, I, I'll, I'll reveal this later. I mean, I'll talk with you all about this at another time. But, but, but there are people who are um, claiming themselves to be God. That's a haughty spirit. That means you don't need God. You're not in a deficit for spirit. And I need the Holy Spirit. I need him. I I need my cavity. This is another way of saying that blessed are those who are empty so I can fill them. Hmm. Because God is spirit. Hmm. And so, you know, some of us are so, we, we, we got our own way going. We know our own path. We are our own gods. We are worshiping ourselves instead of worshiping. But those who have a thirst for God's spirit, hallelujah, theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. Look what it says. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. The meek means strength under restraint. That means you can destroy, but you don't use your power to destroy when you have the authority, Jesus, to go in and destroy. You don't use that authority. Jesus says that that he could have destroyed people, but he was meek. He turned the other cheek. When you could have diminished or destroyed someone, you took the opportunity to humble yourself and became a builder instead of a destroyer. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth, the whole earth. My Lord, look at this. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Are you hungry for righteousness to do the right thing? Or are you still kind of walking around trying to, you know, enjoying doing the wrong thing? Right? Um, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed, you know, merciful. When people need mercy, how about this? Have mercy on me. Put yourself in in um, in the position of a judge who has the ability to judge someone and to throw the book at them. But, but, but the person says, your honor, I beg the mercy of this court. Are you merciful? Um, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart. Not, you know, not trying to be the king of the world. I don't want to be the king of the world because Satan is the prince of the earth. And so when Satan's the prince of the earth and I'm trying to be the king of the world, I'm really trying to mimic what he what he is as opposed to what my father is. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, not the hell raisers. But the peacemakers, for they shall be called the, look at this, sons of God. They could raise a ruckus because they had, had the authority to do so, but they are peacemakers like their father. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake because I, I'm persecuted because I, the right thing, when I do the right thing, my friends, hallelujah, think that I'm weak. My friends will look at me and, and, and call me names and say that, that, that you, just like Job's friends and saying, why don't you give that foolishness up? 
and just join us and do the wrong thing. But it says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, I, that, that I'm called names, that I'm looked down upon, I'm frowned upon, I'm not popular, I'm not any of those things, but because I want to do what's right, it's for righteousness sake, right? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then it says, it, 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 it points this in because he's talking to the disciples of old, but, but incidentally, he's talking to the disciples of new, that's us. With the same message, he said, blessed are you. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Falsely. Not they say evil things about you and it's true. Now, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. It says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. How could you rejoice when, when, when you're being ostracized, when you're being persecuted, when you're being uh, looked down upon, when you're being talked about, right? How, how could you be glad, exceeding, not just glad, be exceeding glad because your mind is not on the things that are going down on the earth level. Your mind is elevated. Hallelujah. For great is your reward in heaven, it says. That, that's what, look at the prize. Great is your reward in heaven. And, and, and time out. Preachers have got to start telling their people that heaven is a beautiful place. Hallelujah. When we talk about heaven, we're talking about the new creation, new heaven, new earth. And so all those things that people are striving for now will be in our possession. They shall inherit the earth. It will be in our possession, but there won't be anything to defile it at all. But that's the state of heaven for which we're working. We're not going to just float around all day. Nobody wants to go to a heaven where we just float around all day. But, but when, we can, when we can praise our king every day, all day, for the goodness that we will see in him because we've, we've already witnessed the bad. My God. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So I, I want you to look at this, um, and we're pretty, you know, th th this is the chief section right here. Um, but, but look at the characteristics of a disciple. Jesus was saying, all right, guys, I'm getting ready to put you all to work. You're getting ready to follow me, but I need to give you some, um, I need to give you some fund fundamental or foundational instruction so that we can be on one page together as we go out into ministry. You've got to be poor in spirit so I can fill you. You got to be those who will mourn. You, you know, we, we, we can't look at situations and, and just say, oh, well, you, your heart needs to break for what you see in the culture. Your heart needs to break for these folks that were talked about in, in, um, in, in Matthew chapter four. Um, the ones who were sick and afflicted, various diseases, demon possessed, epileptics, paralytics, all those folks who were broken, all those folks who were in bad situations and in a bad way. Your heart needs to break. You ought to mourn, right? Blessed are they who mourn. Blessed are the meek. You got power, but you don't use it against people. Those who thirst and hunger for righteousness. Do you hunger for righteousness? Do you thirst? Is that what you're thirsty for? Or are you just thirsty for a meal? It says, blessed are the merciful. I know it looks weak, but guess what? Jesus said, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Are you a peace? These are the characteristics. This is what you need, guys. This is what you need, girls. This is what you need before we get ready to go out into this culture. We're not going out as a, as a military offer with a two-edged sword. Well, it is a two-edged sword. They just didn't know it yet. But we're not going out to destroy folks so that we can be on top. We're going out to show how love can, can transform a community. My God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Are you blessed? Are you blessed? Just asking that. Look with me at, at the, uh, the, next, the next part. Um, it says, um, he, he further reinforces. He said, you are. Y'all say this with me. I am. I am. So you are the salt of the earth. That's what he said. He's telling these disciples, and he's telling us, you are the salt of the earth. That's who you are. That's your identity. That's your ID. You're the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt loses its flavor, how can it be seasoned? How shall it be seasoned? You know, I, I think God was trying to tell us because there's a tendency in our church experience, just like there was a tendency among the disciples when they went out into the culture to witness that we have a tendency to lose our flavor. And so how shall it be seasoned? It says, it is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Are we good or are we good for nothing? So verse 14, you are, say I am, I am. I am. You are the light of the world. You're the light. It's dark out there. Mm. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand and, and then gives light to all those who are in the house. Are you light in your house? Are you light in your community? Are you light on your job? Are you light in your church? Are you light in your culture? Are you light on your social media? <coughs> Every place where you hang out, do you bring light? Or are you just, do you just kind of obscure yourself in the darkness? We are the light. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It's about bringing him glory. And, 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 the, and the question is, he was really giving them opening instructions and saying, are you fit for the job? Or are you just playing church? We got a job to do. Look how he finishes this off. He said, verse 17, do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He said, for assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Let's, let's break that down. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. That's what people told. I don't know where we got that stuff from because Jesus said he didn't. He said, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He said, I came and I fulfilled the law. The law is still in place. But Jesus fulfilled it. Does that make some sense? Mm. That it's not, it wasn't erased. It wasn't thrown out as if it was just ineffective and no good. It was set in place so that we could see who we were. It was set in place so that we could, we could understand. Without the law, we wouldn't know that we were sinners. And so look, look at this. He said, but he came to fulfill it. That means that I came as the embodiment of one who obeyed every part of the law. He came to fulfill it. For surely I say unto you, say to you, till heaven and earth pass away. He said, until heaven and earth, until I recreate the heaven and earth. Hallelujah. Y'all know what I mean. He said, not one jot, not, not one jot or one tittle, not one character. That's a grammatical character. No dot on the I, no cross on the T, nothing, no, no small. This was Hebrew talk back then. It's Hebrew uh, grammar. But a jot and a tittle, he said, not one of those will by any means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. He said, nothing is going to be changed in the law. It just has to be fulfilled. I'm not going to, I'm not going to write one other kind of law to overcome this kind of law. I'm not, there's no corruption in Christ. Verse 19, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, he was being sarcastic, right? You said you by no, will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. He was helping uh, the, the culture to understand. He said this was really setting up the whole teaching of the New Testament in, in the epistles, in the letters. When we get to the Romans and, you know, when we, when we get to Galatians, Ephesians, you know, all those. He was really setting up all of this is really going to be developed in, in greater, in greater uh, depth toward each of those churches so that the people could understand um, what Jesus came to do. So I say this as we close out tonight. Look at this. Um, it, here's the application of the text. It helps us as modern day disciples of Jesus Christ to look at the process the disciples went through during the earthly ministry of Jesus. It helps to put ourselves in the shoes of the disciples and evaluate ourselves by the criteria Jesus set up in his early teaching of the 12. How do you measure up? 
how do we measure up? Look at yourself. How do you measure up? What areas do you have to work um, to, to do work um, in? Little work or major work? It doesn't matter. But what areas? Other people's lives are dependent on you working on yours. We, 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 get, a, um, we get a snapshot. And I put a little magnifying glass just so that we can look very carefully at the text. It's important for us to know um, who we are, how we're supposed to um, conduct ourselves so that we are salt and light. Not when we, I don't know who taught you different, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm following Jesus. If this is what he said, do. This is what we need to do. He didn't change the script because this is 2022. Mm -hmm. If this is what's going to grip the culture, if this is what is going to be um, salt to season the culture, mm -hmm. if this is what's going to be light in the culture, this is what we ought to work on and what we ought to become. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for um, what you did with your disciples of old and what you are continuing to do in this day and, and in this age, Lord God, with us. God, we want to repent. We want to apologize for mm -hmm. the days where we really tried to do things our own way. We thank, we thank you for just this time of concentrated study in your word so that we can, we, we can reprogram ourselves, that we can, um, you know, may, maybe we learn some things along the way that just wasn't what you said. And, what, and, and, and we can't make excuses and say, yeah, but we got to learn to receive your word and obey your word. Mm -hmm. God, and so we thank you that we can receive it tonight because you are still on that mountain and we are still sitting at your feet, hungry and thirsty for your righteousness. Help us to be um, what you desire for us to be, that you can win a world, oh God, when we come to rejoice at the kingdom that becomes populated because we did it your way. We thank you in advance, Lord God, for telling us what to do. We ask, oh God, that you would just touch every life, touch every heart, forgive sins, Lord God. Cause us, Lord God, not to go into hiding, but to come out of obscurity and to say, yes, I'm, I'm tired of hiding. This is me. And as long as I'm doing it his way, he is pleased. We thank you for it and thank you for this word. Bless your people now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We love you and we thank God for you. We just uh, admonish you to worship your king. How can you do that? Do that by um, obeying the word of counsel um, in, the, in the lesson and the... Uh, and living a life that is pleasing and glorifying to him. Good night. Be a blessing to somebody.